After reflecting on the last five decades, I've come to realize that I have a story. One of my music and my sound, and the marvelous collaborations with friends and colleagues. With a little help from these friends, I will share with you the journey that has shaped my musical life. I suppose every musician has a story, and my story is not new, but it is mine. Welcome to The Path Taken, hosted by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. There will probably not be another show quite like this episode in the entirety of The Path Taken because we're talking to the son of which our protagonist revolves, Tanya Farley. Along with my interview with her, there will be excerpts of a conversation these life partners had together, telling stories only they can tell. This is as bare your soul to the world as it gets. Hi, Alton. How you doing? I'm good. It's good to see your pretty face. <laughs> I appreciate being called pretty. You are. <laughs> well, I appreciate you doing this. Um, actually, I've been waiting on this for a little while because this whole thing really kind of revolves around you, even though it doesn't revolve around you, because we all know you're the queen. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's right. See, without you, I don't think a lot of this happens quite the same way it did. Well, thank you. So, yes. So since... Since we're talking to you and you're such a big part of this, let's talk about you. You know, I never felt like the queen all those years. I, I never felt like the queen. I felt like I was one of the boys. Well, I get that too. But if you know Tom, then we all know. I was surrounded by men. Yeah. But when Tom gets into music mode and technical mode and PA sound system mode, that's all he's into. And basically, I just, um, I think you have to be a very special person as a woman to be in a band and be involved with a bunch of male musicians and their egos. Although my husband never had an ego. He always was always very, very humble and very helpful and just Every, it, everything had to be right. It was all about the music. Right. But but um, I think it takes a special kind of a woman to be able to be in a band with a lot of males and understand everything that goes on in the clubs. In other words, the interactions between the other band members, their friends, women, all the stuff going around, you just have to kind of step back. And, of course, I never had to worry about that with Tom. And Tom really never had to worry about that with me. I think the first seven years that we played in the band, that we were married, I don't think either one of us wore wedding bands. And that's secret. Wow. I, so, well, you've just told everybody. Yeah. <laughs> he got He got to see... I got to see what was going on with him and all the women throwing themselves at him. And he got to see a little bit too. So anyway, but we always went home together. So that's all that mattered to us and the music. That's all that ever matters. Okay. Well, that's just a little thing. You don't have to put that in. Oh no, this is going in. This is, this okay. is interesting. Well, by, by the way, take out that, that, <laughs> that I did the interview with Tom yesterday uh -huh. and it, uh, we got married in 1976, and I said it was the centennial, which would have meant that uh, it was 1876 for the uh, birthday of our country. And he had to correct me and say it was the bicentennial, Mr. History Teacher. And I just started laughing, and I went, duh, because at 1826, on, on July 4th, uh, um, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both died on the same day. They did. Absolutely. And I don't know where I got the centennial, but anyway, I did say on there, Alton, take this out. So, but if you leave it in, you got to make sure you leave the part where it says, Alton, you can take this part out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know what? When I go over it, I'll think about it. Cause that's funny. That was, that was the only, only real screw up that I made. But anyway, well, he's the history major. So understood. He's 
Okay, let's go. I'm sorry. It's all good. It was it was good. Okay, well, since we're talking about you first and how you relate to Tom, which really is about you, how were you when? Because see, a lot of people don't realize that you. Well, maybe they do a little bit now, but they don't realize that you're a musician too. So you, you know, true. How old were you when you started your interest in music? Um, I guess I was like six or seven when um, there was always music around my house. My father was really into music. He was into John Philip Sousa marches. He was into country music. I remember as a little girl dancing with him in the living room um, to waltzes. Um, All different kinds of music was around, even rock and roll. I mean, they even had rock and roll. I guess it would have been like, Elvis Presley or something, right. but the, that, that was even in our, in our house. Okay. And I'm one of six children. Now, like, were all you guys interested in music or was it just you or? Um, well, my little brother played drums for us for six or seven years. So he was into music. I have a twin sister. She never got into music ever. She didn't even know how to turn a page. Okay. Uh, my younger sister is a was a jazzercise instructor and um, also a personal trainer. So she had music because she had to learn how to do the routines and dance to it and lead classes. And she was number 13 as far as dance instructors for jazzercise in the world while she was doing wow. it. And then my older two brothers, they got into the accordion. And my one second oldest brother, Tom, he kind of quit. He really wasn't that interested in it anymore. But my other brother, Ray, my oldest brother, he continued to play accordion and still does today. Okay. Well, did, you know, leading into that as a segue, I mean, did you play any instruments at all? I did. At 11 years old, my mom and dad bought me a piano and I started playing piano and I took lessons. And I remember my very first, my very first recital the song was Fairy Princess. Is that from that, a is that from a ballet or something? Or I don't remember, but I just it's Fairy Princess. Okay. Now, did that lead into any other instruments or did you just stay there? I pretty much for about oh, I guess five years, I just was with the piano and taking lessons. And when I got to high school, um I was dating one of the tackles on the football team. And I was also in the concert and marching band. And so I played flute. I took up the flute and I became a majorette. And so I didn't play the flute with the marching band, but I did with the concert band. So then I took up the flute. Okay. All right. Wow. You've had kind of a, you just had a path. So I would imagine, because I, I have never heard that you played fl- flute before. Did you? St- do you still play? Um, no, I don't. I still, I, I don't. I haven't in years. Okay. I mean, I, I still know the fingerings. I still know how to put it together and hold it and all that stuff and blow into it. But as far as like sight reading and playing something like uh, anything by Jethro Tull or anything, no. Okay, I get that. <laughs> well, did you? Because like Tom has a story with his first instrument. And so do you have one on, you know, on your end? Did you, who bought your first instrument? Who, or was it a piano that was always there? No, my mom and dad went out and bought an upright piano. Okay. And put it in the living room. So it was my mom and dad. Okay. So they kind of bet the farm that you were going to play. Yeah. I think they also thought my brothers would, but then my brothers, we were all going to a school of music, Griggs school of music. And so my, but my two brothers mainly went to learn accordion because Mr. Griggs was excellent on guitar, but he was also excellent on accordion. Okay. And so my dad signed us up, all three of us to go to Griggs school of music. Got it. Got it. So what were your teen years like after, you know, I guess adolescence, what was that like for you? (laughs) (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) You don't want to know. Um, We want to know a little bit. How about a little bit? um, Well, as I got older, I don't know what it was, but my father kind of turned into a tyrant. 
he was not a very nice man and he was very critical. In other words, here's just one, I'll let you, I'll let the rest of it go. This is just one instance that I remember. And it was, he invited some of his friends over and he wanted me to play piano for them. And so he yelled for me and he said, Tanya, come out here and play the cracks for my friends. So I guess that meant play in between the keys because that's where the cracks are. But I was very embarrassed and I felt like that was very critical. Uh -huh. But I don't know, it was because he had two twin teenage daughters. He decided he was going to like, you know, really crack down on us or what? But my twin was a Susie cream cheese. She never did anything wrong, but I was a very rebellious teen. I was not up to taking any shit from my father. I didn't want to hear it. So I would say it about, I would say about 15, 15 or 16. I'd really had it, but I was still in high school. So I had to live there. That experience or just in your you know, your teen years at all have a, a a bad effect or good effect on your playing at all? Did it make you stop playing or? Yeah, it had a bad effect on it. Um, I married, I got married when I was 17 and a half. Okay. So that I could get away from home. Um, that marriage lasted three and a half years. I was working in a hospital and going to Old Dominion University trying to study to be a nurse, I made sure that my first husband got the rest of his his Bachelor of Arts degree and then put him through for his master's degree. And then I found a condom in, <laughs> in his um, glove compartment and I blew it up, tied it off and put it on the door knob of his office. And shortly after that, we got divorced because um found out he wasn't very faithful. So I was about 22 at the time and I did not want to go home. I refused to go home. And my father begged me to come back home. Came back home. My little sister is seven years younger than I am. And he found birth control pills in her purse and just beat the shit out of her. And I was in the garage and I said, dad, I said, you need to calm down. Um, I said, she loved you enough to protect her body and to make sure that she didn't make you a grandfather. And he backhanded me so hard that I almost ended up from the garage out into the street. And that night I had my thumb out with my suitcase and that ended my visit home. And I never went home again. Wow. All righty. Nice man. May he rest in peace. I don't want to talk too bad about him because you're not supposed to speak bad about the dead. But he was not and never in my entire life did he ever come out to hear the band. Never did he tell me he loved me. And never did I make him proud. Those were the only two things that I wanted from my father was his love and for, and to make him proud. My mother, on the other hand, she was very proud and she divorced him eventually, but she was very proud. So I guess that was enough, but yeah, I was not, I was not into music that whole time. And then another little piece of information. I got married again at the age of 23. I married a guy that was 31 years old and he was the, Dave, or you can call him Nick, one of the um, disc jockeys for Wowie, W-O-W-I radio station. Yeah, okay, I remember that. It was progressive rock back then, mm -hmm. and I was married to him for a year and a month. He also liked to mess around a lot. He was also an actor in a, a couple of theater uh, 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 groups, and um, he liked to mess around a lot. So we, we were married a year and a month. And I divorced him, uh, but boy, I got a great record collection because all those records that said for promotional for promotion <laughs> only, not right. for sale, <laughs> took them all with me. It was funny. This is a funny story. 
He took me to work. We only had one car. It was a Buick Electra 225 convertible. He took me to work one day and it, I didn't work that far from home. We were living in Ghent and I thought something was odd. Something was weird. So I talked to my boss and I walked home and I was hiding behind this shrub and I saw him loading everything he owned into that car. And I watched, he was leaving me and I watched and I looked at my hands and I had the keys in my hand. And I got in that car and drove off with every bit of his shit, <laughs> leaving him standing in the street. And I went straight to my mother's house. That's how I got all the promotional copy albums. <laughs> and, I and I unloaded it. And then I said, you can have the car back and you can pay it off because I don't want it. And I'll see you in divorce court. I paid for both of my divorces, which were cheap back then. I paid for both of them and left my first husband with all the furniture, everything. All I took were my clothes. And the second husband, well, he had the furniture, <laughs> but he didn't have much of what he what he really wanted. So anyway, that's how I got him. But he was a he was not a very nice person. But he didn't he didn't mind having any evidence on his person that he'd been with someone else. I'll just say it like that. Wow. All right. <laughs> Okay. Pretty pretty shady, huh? Yeah, it's a lot shady. It's a lot yeah. shady. But then I met the man of my dreams. Well, oh, okay, hold on, God. hold on, hold on. Before we get to that, through all of this turmoil, I mean, were you were you song were you writing songs at all? Or were you playing at no. all? No. No. There's too much drama in my life. Okay, I hear no. that. Because I was thinking uh, that would be the answer, because I'm listening to you and I'm going. I don't think she's been playing at all. That's a lot to deal with. I didn't I I didn't just blame I was listening to all these women and all these people telling me that David, who was my second husband, was being unfaithful. And I didn't believe it. And so this girl moved in. We were in a house that was split into five apartments. This girl, Charlene, moved into the very upstairs apartment, the fifth apartment. And I didn't know it at the time, but she was gay and she had been in prison. She pulled time three years in the state pen. Anyway, she and I got to be friends. She was very, very sweet, very nice girl. And I really liked her. And I thank her because one day we were at my house and we were talking and I said, I just can't get over this, um, Charlene. I just can't believe that this is going on. She goes, well, let's do this. Let's do this. She goes, he's on the air right now. Let's give him a call over there at the radio station. See what he feels like doing. See, that, see how he's talking. So he had music going and we knew when the segues came and we also knew that he could just punch in a segue and uh, talk to her. So she called him, told him her name was Lynn, told him her name was Linda. And that she really liked the sound of his voice. And they started talking. And he commenced to tell her everything he'd like to do to her on the sofa there in the in the studio. And we recorded it on real to real tape. So that was the big thing that I had that made him go along with divorce. I had wow. him on tape saying. <laughs> <Okay>. that. <laughs> and it doesn't sound nice. But it does give you background on why I wasn't into music at the time. Right. There's too that. much drama. Right. Too too much drama. I, I, I never thought that my piano, I never thought I would ever sing in a band. So I, I mean, I, that never even crossed my mind. Maybe that was fate, and that's what brought me to Tom. I don't know. Understood. And that's the segue. Now, now we can talk about Tom. Yeah. So let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're not with anyone at this point. And so nothing's going on musically. No. You're, you're just out of all this drama. I've just moved into an apartment all by myself. Right. I'm working at a bar for the Holiday Inns at the corner of Virginia Beach Boulevard and Tidewater Drive. Right. And I'm the day bartender. And so I order all the liquor and, you know, balance all the sheets from the night or the day before, the night and day before. And I uh, give them to the innkeeper. And so basically I was just managing the bar and working day shift. 
which was good. I didn't want to be out at night because my husband was, he was a, a little seedy. I mean, he knew I was going on a trip. And as a matter of fact, it was the first trip Tom and I were going to take. And um, I had a Buick LaSabra. He went under the hood and he disconnected all the wires under the hood. So we couldn't drive to a wedding in D.C. But that was the type of person he was. So I didn't want to be out at night. I was really afraid to be out at night. So how'd you meet Tom? Because, I mean, this seems to be the linchpin to all of this. So how'd you meet yeah. Tom? Well, I had worked all day. Mm -hmm. And I was home. And my partner was Janet. Um, she and I have still friends. She still works at the uh, airport um, bar. She's just wonderful. But she was going to college. She was going to school. That's why I work the day shift. But she called me and she said, Tanya, she said, there's this guy playing here tonight or supposed to play here tonight. And he had just come to set up. So she was listening to his sound check. So it was early in the evening, probably like around 5.30, 6, 7.30, something like that. Anyway, she said he's, he really has a great voice. And she said, and his, his material is super. I think maybe you should come back. I think you should come back to the Holiday Inn. Okay. I get there and I went, okay, okay. And, you know, I went and sat over where the bartenders sat, where Janet and I were talking. And I mean, the place started to really fill up and I didn't, I didn't have to work, but, you know, I told Janet, I said, if you need me to help you, I'll help you. She goes, no, I got it. Everything's fine. Just, just sit back and listen. And I didn't know who his parents were. I didn't know anything. But I did call one of my cousins, Brian. And Brian came down and we started drinking wine. And so we're drinking wine and we're listening to the music. And I swear to God, when he sang that line, pass me a cigarette. I think there's one in my raincoat from America by Simon and Garfunkel. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> so that was the moment, huh? That was the moment. I don't, it wasn't love, but it was lust. It was something. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> something. All right. Okay, people. I couldn't admit this one. Tom telling his side of he and Tanya's first meeting is sweet, hilarious, and totally dude basic. Check it out. Well, let me interject something right here just to get on the bandwagon. Uh, I saw her, and uh, she was sitting at the table. She had this beautiful, long, blonde hair, these really nice-looking gypsy hoop earrings, and a leather skirt, and legs crossed, smoking a cigarette. That leg just uh, just bouncing, you know. And I looked at her. I said, damn, she really was something. Continue, sweetie. <laughs> And he went on to do some of the best stuff. Oh, God. And the way he could finger pick. And the way, I, I don't know. He's just, he was just beautiful to me. And he had long hair, long curly hair. And he was six foot four. And I was like all of five, three. And he was just, he was just beautiful. That's all. He was just a beautiful man. And, you know, I... I just really enjoyed hearing him. And my cousin and I, before you know it, we had shared uh, three bottles of wine. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I was a little, I was a little messed up, but anyway, I wanted the breaks before I got really messed up and I could still talk. Tom came over and sat and talked with me and we had a really nice conversation, but he had to go back up for another set. So I sat through the next set my cousin I was still drinking and at the end of the gig after he packed up I was saying goodbye to Janet and I was talking to Tom and I said you want to come home with me I invited him to my house that night I'm not very I'm a slut but anyway <laughs> and of course he said yeah sure shit yeah oh is that what he said no he was really polite Okay. Was, I think he said something like, that would be nice. Something like that. Okay, he that sounds more like him. Yeah. Yeah. He said something really sweet. And uh, we got to my house. I was, I was so drunk. And he was hungry. And the next thing I see is he's eating 
tuna fish salad and vanilla ice cream. Wow. Okay. Oh my God, my stomach, it just did a flip. I don't know what happened, but I was standing in front of him and I just passed out. Woke up in bed with him. <laughs> All right. And the rest is history. Yes. Because I is. wasn't when I woke up, I wasn't drunk anymore. <laughs> that's a good thing. Surprise, surprise. Well, okay. Well, see, that's that's the that's the linchpin relationship. So take us from that moment to how your music came back to you. Okay. Well, that little son of a gun, we spent the night and the rest of the day, because it was a Sunday, spent the rest of the day together. And at the time, he didn't have a car. Um, and his he was sharing a house with his best friend, Steve Gallagher, and a couple other guys. And, oh, his bedroom was just, oh, decked out. Mattress on the floor, pasteboard boxes turned sideways with his clothes folded in them. Um, he had nothing. He didn't even have, he didn't have a, a car. So I took him home and showed me his house. And I didn't hear from him for three weeks, Alton. Are you serious? He did not call me for three weeks. Wow. Are you see, he ghosted you for three weeks. I thought to myself, hmm. Was it just me that felt something? What is going on here? I mean, I've heard of somebody. He seemed kind of shy and he seemed kind of protected, you know, protected of his feelings, or you know, but he also seemed to know his way around a woman. And so I didn't understand what was going on. So I just thought to myself, and back then we didn't have texting. We didn't have any of that stuff. So you either had to call somebody or you just had to go by and show up at the door. So I called him and I invited him to dinner. And so he said, yeah, just like nothing had happened, you know, like it hadn't been three weeks. Right. So um, we went to dinner, went to a little Italian place called Pauline's. Nowadays, it's called Froggies on Shore Drive. And, yes, um, I'm familiar. Yeah. And um, we had dinner, and he came back to my apartment with me. And we were talking almost all night. We spent the night together um, and never have been apart since. We've always been together. And so we were living in my one-bedroom apartment. For a couple of months, and my lease was up, and we decided we were going to rent a house together. So we did. But while that was going on, Tom was playing with a band called the Monty Grain Band, and they had a drummer, a bass player, Tommy Lavin, who was our bass player on the the uh, Songsmith album, um, and Vernon Martin, who we sang with in Cimarron right. for so many years, uh, and Rob Mickley was the drummer. Okay. So they had this band going, and and he was living with these guys. He had moved from the beach, and he was now living in right on the line of Chesapeake and Virginia Beach, uh, down near Providence Road. And so um, we decided to get a place together. He wanted to get away from them. I was getting out of my lease. It was a one-bedroom, small apartment. So we decided to rent a house, and we did. And with that, Vernon started coming over. And I don't know why they decided to ask me to sing with them, except for that Tom had heard me sing and we never sat down and played music together, but, you know, just singing to songs on the radio in the car and stuff like that. So they asked me to be, to sing with them. And the first time that we sang, um, we did uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, Fallen and Spinning. It's a real strong three-part harmony. Mm -hmm. And when we did that song and the harmonies came out, I mean, you got goosebumps because the voices blended so well together. And I think that's the start of it was when we moved into the house together. And um, 
Um, you know, I say we were never apart again. He was living with those guys and I was living in my apartment, but I either spent the night at his place or he spent the night at my place. We were never apart for a night, you know, until I think it was when he recorded Songsmith and he and Stevie traveled to Nashville to have the album mixed and mastered um, at uh, Quadraphonics where Dan Fogelberg and all those guys went in Nashville. All right. Took my love, took it down. Climbed a mountain and I turned around And I saw my reflection Through the snow-covered hills Till the landslide brought me down Oh, mirror in the sky What is love? Can a child within my heart rise above? Can I sail through the changing Ocean tides Can I handle The seasons of My life I, 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 I. Mm-hmm. Well I Give in a parade Of changing Cause I built My life Around you but time makes you bolder, even children get older, and time getting older too. Time makes you bolder, even children get older, and time getting older too. Whoa, I'm getting older too. Why take my love, take it down? Why climbed a mountain and I turned around? And if you see my reflection in the snow-covered hills, will the landslide bring it down? And if you see my reflection in the snow-covered hills, oh, will the landslide bring it down? Oh, oh, oh the landslide bring it down. That's the first time we were, I think, separated for the night. It wow. was a few nights. So that was a long time. Well, five years. <laughs> that's that's a good start. That's yeah. a good start. So it's beyond the obvious that Tom and Tanya got married. However, having the lovebirds talk about their love story is more than necessary. These two being like water for each other. Tom had asked me to marry him, and I had said yes, that I wanted to marry him. And um, do you remember the name of the place? Oh, wait a second. So on Atlantic Avenue. I know it's a hotel. Yeah. And we were sitting on the bench in front of the ocean, and Virginia, real uh, close. It was the Carriage Inn. Carriage Inn. Yeah, okay. I was, I was working there as a close Virginia, <laughs> Virginia Carriage. Yeah, that's close. Anyway, um, yeah. And so when he asked me, I said yes. And I think that was probably like in 
July or August. I can't remember. It was the summer. All I know is October 2nd, 1976, the year of our nation, or the 50th year of our nation, right? Bicentennial. Bicentennial. Yeah. That's 50. No, that's 200 200. years. Cut that one out. (laughs) Cut that out, Elton. Anyway, um, uh, we uh, got married. On the Willow Wisp Farm, which was up in the mountains, or sat outside of Blacksburg, Tom's Tom's mom and dad's farm, and we had. Um, it, it was, was a, a destination wedding to Floyd County. Yes, it was a destination, but we only, but we we only invited our very closest friends, and of course, I was in a band with two guys. I didn't have many girlfriends, but my sister was my matron of honor, Ah uh, Joanne who still remains my, my best friend. Um, and our parents were there, my my mother and father, tyrant that he was. They, he showed, they showed up. Um, and so we got married in the beautiful living room of my mom and dad's home with a wonderful pastor. His, it was Pastor Vander, Vanderbilt, Vander Hagen, Vander something. Anyway. And our marriage vows were not the basic marriage vows. Tom and I had talked about it, and we decided that we didn't, you know, we knew we'd be together and through sickness and everything, and whether we were rich or poor, but we also wanted to put an emphasis on both of us, you know, um, um, recognizing one another as individuals and allowing one another to be an individual and to follow their passions and be there and believe in them and go with them. So it was no problem for me. And it's never been a problem for Tom. Um, I can remember times when I'd be out with my girlfriends and we'd be getting slot, you know, having a great time. And um, he'd be at home writing music and always smile on his face when I came home. Never. Where were you? What were you doing? Um, it takes a special person to let another person be an individual. And I think both Tom and I had that in us. Um, I agree. So that's, that's basically, that was basically our wedding vows. That was basically the way it went. We had a reception in the, in the basement with me and Tanya and Vernon singing, uh, singing songs and stuff like that. Uh, you sang your song to your mom, I think the first time you don't have to. Because I got a picture of her sitting there listening to you singing to her. That's right. I don't know if that song that was a song or not, but she definitely enjoyed it. She was sitting right next to it, just sitting there and just really soaking it all up. She his really enjoyed and, it. His mom and dad were just unbelievable. I just loved them so much. I still love them, and I miss them so much. But they, they had so much belief. They had three sons. Tom was the middle one, but oh, my God, they had... So much belief and love for him and his talent. It was it was it was a beautiful thing to see. It really was. It was a beautiful thing to see. Yeah, they uh, they were supportive all the way uh, throughout the well, their the entire rest of their lives, and that that's a, it's a precious thing. Uh, it's rare. It's really really rare. But uh, we got to, after Simron just kind of faded out. We uh, can I just can I just add one thing before? Sure. The, the, The um, people that came to our wedding, I'll say this real fast, Um, there were about 30 guys. They were all friends of Tom's, and the bachelor party was at his younger brother's house, who was down the road from his mom and dad's, had no plumbing, had no lights, uh, but they had vodka and tie stick, and so all 30 of them just went down there and had a ball and left me with his mom and dad, who I really didn't know all that well, but I guess this was my getting used to them period. And finally, he comes home, you know, and had a big grin on his face and just had a great time. And I was really happy. And we didn't believe in that thing that you can't see the husband or the wife or the bride or the groom the night before. So we had it the next morning. By the time I got my shower, they'd all had showers and the water was a little <laughs> muddy. The water was a little bit brown. Yeah, we got down to the bottom of the well that time. Um, but it's okay. We Everything turned out all right. Um, uh, I don't know. Evidently, I wasn't in one of my, you know, losing it moods. Because uh, it was my wedding day. 
I went out real early with one of the guys on a motorcycle and we collected all these beautiful colored leaves because it was fall and we decorated the whole um um uh, mantle mantle in his parents house and his dad had this heatilator system on his uh, fireplace that blew <laughs> heat out into the room from the fire and by the time we got married all the leaves were all brown and crackly <laughs> <laughs> that was funny as crap. Yeah, it was. But you know, it's 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 just part of the of the charm of the entire day. It was a great day. It was. It was a great day and it was a great night. And we so had, now we had daisies on our on our wedding cake. That was our flower. Yes, we did. And, and we, we went to the Crater Lake more Crater Lake Motel because all the other places were were filled up because Tech had a home game and I was too stupid to remember that. So we ended up at Clater Lake, but it was fine because it was a it was beautiful, beautiful view. Beautiful, it was. It, it, I wouldn't. I couldn't have cared less if I was in a pasteboard box. As long as I was with Tom, I didn't care. You know, none of none of none of the big, big, um, you know, rich, pushy, and your face things ever really mattered to me. My father was kind of like that, but none of none of that stuff mattered to me. I was at home. I was at home in his parents' house in the in the country, in the mountains, in his arms. I just was fine. Yeah, me too. If I'm talking too much, stop me. I will not. <laughs> <laughs> I will not stop you. This was all about. Okay. Well, so so you're singing. Yes. You're all singing together. Yes. And so no keyboards yet. No keyboards yet. Okay, so Go from that point to when you actually started playing again. Okay. Well, we did Cimarron. Cimarron was a three-piece act, and it was two guitars, three vocals. We were really popular. We had a big following. It was a lot of fun. We did oh, all kinds of really good stuff music-wise. Um, I mean, we did, we did some Fleetwood Mac. Oh, let's see. We did Jonathan Edwards. We did um, oh, just a whole bunch of different acts. And we, we were really popular. And so um, Vernon was pretty popular with the ladies. And his attention span was was getting really sketchy as far as coming and making um, practices. Although Tanya has laid the groundwork for her experience with Cimarron, both Tom and Tanya go a little deeper on the subject. Music was a really large part of his life. In fact, that's all he was doing at the time because he had taken a break from teaching. And I loved his material. I loved his songs. I thought he he was a really good poet. I also thought that uh, he played guitar really well. Um, and I don't really remember... When it was that we started singing together, I can't pinpoint the exact date that it was, but um, all of a sudden, I was in this group called Cimarron with him and Vernon. And well, Let's talk about it, the, the Cimarron thing. I mean, you know, that was a, a really good experience. I mean, you know, we, we, we hadn't peaked yet, but... Uh, we really enjoyed uh, singing stuff with Vernon. We sang a lot of Fogelberg, you know, and a lot Crosby of his Stills and Nash. Crosby Stills and Nash. A lot of his uh, background stuff that he could use. A lot of his uh, um, his uh, acoustic stylings and stuff like that. It was a great group, and you know, Tommy Lavin would be sitting in on it with us on, on occasion. Bass player, yeah. Yeah, what a great bass player. Um, you know, it was it was a great time for us. We played all the all the major clubs around the area. It's baloney. It was a very scary time for me. Oh, I, I never it. pictured myself singing with these two great voices and and this songwriter, my husband now, my husband. I just n- never even imagined that that was where my life would go. But anyway, it was fun. And when those three voices would come together, oh my God, it just send chills right through you. Yeah, it was pretty magic stuff. We even... Uh the last real major gig that we had together as a group was at uh, Frankie's Place for Ribs out on uh, Alaskan Road, a few blocks off the beach. 
And we had a great situation. They built us a stage, put in a power thing, put in a light thing, uh, put a put an extension out so a person can run the board from uh, you know out in the audience. It was great. All because a tight contract was written up by Tom, and they signed it. Yeah, it was good. It was uh, Eddie Aragona and, and Frank uh, Frank Bauman. And Frank was great the to us. Mafia of Virginia yeah. Beach. <laughs> yeah, you know, Frank was great to us. Um, and what we did was, me and Tanya and Vernon were singing, and Cam had just come off the road from uh, doing the sound, uh, working sound and being a roadie with Merle Haggard. And uh, Donna was pregnant, his wife. So we figured, you know, what we'd do is we'd have him, we had a six-month contract with them. We'd have them, you know, um, uh, have Cam run the sound, and while he was at it, we'd rehearse and get bring in Tommy Lavin on bass, and that and Cam is an awesome, uh, you know, uh, electric guitar player. And at the end of the six months, we'd have enough money saved to where uh, we'd be able to go out and uh, uh, as a rehearsed, full blown group with great vocals and killer music. But that never happened. We were already that, sweetie. Before Frankie's House of Ribs, we were already playing Abbey Road, The Jewish Mother, The Cave, The yeah. Crystal, Country Comfort, all those bands. It wasn't. Frankie's that that brought it all together. No, but that that was that to me was the the master plan. And uh, we the thing was we never ever really had uh, got together for rehearsals. Um, uh, evidently, Vernon didn't want to do it, so uh, we just kept on doing it. Vernon, I think, wanted to do it. I just think he was he was absent at the time. He was I think he was more interested in the women and that side of it at the time. He was young. And side note, one of the women that, the one woman that he was really, really into was my baby sister. Okay. They eventually got married and had a child together who is 33 years old now. And he's got his own son, beautiful young man, but they got a divorce after a while. But Tom had pretty much had it. And I think Vernon had had it. So after seven years, I think it was about seven years, that came to an end. And Cam Head came into the picture. He was just coming off the road from being with Merle Haggard and playing with that star troop or star morning star uh, heavy acid rock band. I know he played lead guitar with a star on his head, a tinfoil star on his head. Wow. Yeah, he was a rocker. But here he was. He wanted to get into acoustic music. I never knew Cam, but there was only one thing I needed to know. That guy could play guitar. Let's give these two a chance to elaborate. And that is who came to sing with the melodious Cimarron. Yeah. Well, the bottom line is we, we, we kind of tapped into his talent a little bit on the Songsmith album. He played a lead on 69 Pimpmobile and uh, Jody Lee Carroll. But uh, that, that he did. Yeah, uh, he did a hell of a job. And Tommy uh, Lavin on bass, yeah. Jody Lee Carroll. You yeah. got to listen to Tommy Lavin on bass on that one. Yeah, that was a goodie. Uh, so I mean, at the end of the day, we, there's a history there. Plus, I met Cam uh, when he was a senior in high school, and I was a first year teacher. So, you know, it goes back a long, long ways. Long, I met him before I met Tanya. But uh, at the end of the day, that was a good experience. We went through a lot of. We went through a lot of bass players in that band. Not, I mean, the the original personnel, me and Tanya and Steve, uh, uh, pretty and Cam were all together, but uh, we had a whole bunch of different bass players, uh, you know, that went through that band. But we we had great stage presence, a lot of energy. That's where high energy acoustics really kicked in. So I mean, you know, that that's a, that's an awful lot of, of fun times on stage with with that man. I can tell you that. Yes. So we started playing with him and Tom was, uh, he was working with his friend, Steve and Steve always had all these keyboard instruments that made all these different sounds and would like a choir and all different kinds of things. And they were experimenting with that in Steve's studio for oh, years. And, uh, Tom decided that he wanted to put together a group. So my little brother came in as drummer. Cam Head came in as lead player. Um, Vernon Martin, we brought him back to give him money to help support my sister and his his son now uh, as bass player. Um, Tom was on rhythm and I was on keyboards. 
And that's when I started playing the keyboards again, um, was at that time. And it was a great band. It was a great band. It was called the Tom Farley Camhead Band. How original. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is so good. Okay. <laughs> So other than other than other than the, the the people that you've just named, or is there any other any other people that have come and gone as far as what you guys what you collaborated with with Tom or you're by yourself? Oh, so many wonderful ones. So many. Tom Lavin probably will go down as the best bass player I've ever heard. Listen to Jody Lee Carroll on Songsmith. Listen to that bass, that bass on uh, Norfolk Days and Jody Lee Carroll. He's unbelievable. He was unbelievable. So Tom Lavin, Donnie Satterwhite on pedal steel. Right. Um, Michael Monahan mm-hmm. played guitar but could sing like a bird. Uh, let's see. What other ones did we have? Um, uh, let's see. Ricky Lutz, who plays the keyboards on Free Me. Okay, okay. Um, Glenn, uh, Greg Weichel, who plays mandolin and guitar. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Excellent player. Um, those are some of the ones that I remember. Those are some of the ones that I remember. We all, we always played with really cool people, people that knew their instruments. And it was just fun to sit and jam with them. And a lot of times they were familiar with Tom's music. So, you know, they either came in and out of the band or sat in or did stuff like that. But for, for about five years, maybe five and a half years, I think the Tom Farley cam head band may have been longer. I'm not really good on the amount of years that we were together with each separate thing, but um, it, it was about maybe five, five and a half years before, for um, my brother Steve and Cam, and I think Vernon was out of the picture because of the divorce, but they decided they wanted to go in a different direction. They wanted to do other stuff, and I think probably Alton, um, that was the biggest disappointment and heartbreak of Tom's life was I mean he understood that they wanted to do something different but the band was so popular and so strong at the time that it kind of took him by surprise and of course don't fuck with my man don't upset him because if you upset him You got the wrath of Tanya on you. And, of course, I was filled with hurt and hate. And even for my own little brother, I couldn't imagine my little brother, who Tom had taken to a studio, put him in that studio with drums, let him record one of the best albums I've ever heard, not being biased, Tom wrote some really good songs on that album and giving him studio time, putting him in a band for all those years. I just, I just couldn't understand why he would leave, but he did. And so that left pretty much Tom and me. And that's when Tom got really serious about messing around with the keyboards. And he got this keyboard called an EPS, which you could program almost anything into and the EPS sat in front of me. I had my keyboards at the keyboard station. The EPS sat in front of me, but above the EPS was my Yamaha was my, my electric piano. And so I was able to play keyboards now while Tom was able to program the drums killer horn section. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did U2 angel of Harlem and Jerry sang it. And it had the full horn section. Okay. My husband programmed his ass off and we did similar features by, um, oh God, Melissa Etheridge. <laughs> we did uh, Baby Can I Hold You Tonight 
by Tracy Chapman. I mean, these are all songs I got to sing because we had, you know, this keyboard that could fill in for anything. The My piano, Tom's um, rhythm, or Jerry's lead guitar couldn't. And Jerry's voice from being in Herndon Edwards and from singing and being in bands all his life, his voice blended really well with ours. So the three-part harmonies were there, right. and we'd known him almost all of our lives. Okay. I mean, Tom was in the Herndon Edwards band for a while, so we'd known them for almost all of our musical life. So he was really familiar with the music. So it made sense. Wow. Turned, okay. turned out to be the best, the best um, band situation I've ever been in. When it comes to singing, I'd have to put Vernon first, but then I'd put right real close behind him, Jerry Herndon. And it was, it, we did that for like, I guess, seven years, something like that. It was wonderful. This period with Jerry spawned so much. However, Baby Can I Hold You and Landslide are certain highlights. Tom and Tanya drill down on the experience. And that was the first band that I, I can think of. I think we were the first band that actually used a program keyboard uh, for their, their bass and their drums and stuff like that, uh, which we were able to engineer really well into the PA. But at the end of the day, that, that was unique because uh, our voices had a very, really interesting harmony, uh, which was different from everybody else, which I loved. And also Jerry was... You know, all you musicians out there could appreciate that. Jerry was very, very kind and very liberal with the fact that he said, okay, I'm going to contribute uh, this stuff to the PA, but it's okay if you run the sound you know, because I trust you. I know that you'll do the, the very best to put us out there, and it worked out great. And then uh, eventually, once we actually had a, uh, about a year, year and a half under our belt, we decided to go into the studio with the songs we had been playing uh, to do the Calm Before the Storm album with, uh, at Earworks with Bob Smith. So I'll let Tanya do some stuff on that one well the cover for the compass for the storm is a picture that i took in st petersburg russia we uh took a field trip with some of tom's kids and went to russia for 10 days back in 1990 and there was a big storm rolling in and i didn't even know i don't think at the time what the name of the of the album was going to be but i took the picture and tom ended up using it on the cover of the come for the storm album uh, what a we recorded it at Earworks Studio uh, with Bob Smith, who to this day is a dream boat and a sweetheart and a a dear friend. He did an excellent job. Yeah, he did. It was a comfortable, comfortable studio. Jerry and I had a blast uh, doing our background vocals. There's quite a few pictures of me just full-on laughing out loud. I mean, belly laughing, some of the stuff, but we were serious about it, and God, it was so magical. Yeah, Bob Bob was, Bob was, I guess you could say, one of the best intersections we ever had. I mean, I, you know, I worked with engineers and stuff like that before, but I knew in the first 10 minutes that this guy was the guy. He was so, uh, you know, open to suggestion, but also he knew his business and knew what would work and what wouldn't. He worked with us uh, in a very timely fashion and was always open to uh, having me sit next to him at the board uh, uh, when, when Tanya and Jerry were doing their thing or when we were mixing the entire thing down. It was absolutely a great relationship, uh, you know, which we still have today. But he was, he was the one that gave me the windscreen because of my P's and my S's. <laughs> <laughs> but Jerry, I think that Jerry did some of his absolute best work on that album, uh, our harmonies were really uh, caught, captured really well by Bob, but some of his uh, some of his actual lead work, especially on things like um, "Coming Apart at the Seams" or "Baby Can I Hold You Tonight," that lead work was just stellar. I mean, it, it's it's a signature. You could tell us Jerry right from the get go because he has a, he has a very distinctive style. Don't come 
rain, like sun rain. Forgive me, is all that you can say. Years gone by and still, words don't come easily. Like forgive me, forgive me. Right time, you'd be mine. I love you. Is all that you can say? Years gone by and still, words don't come easily. But, uh, Another thing that was nice about Jerry was that um, on Baby Can You Hold Me Tonight, uh, he did the very exact lick for lick, same lead in the break every single time. When you're trying to, um, uh, uh, you know, sing the song and know when to come in and hear the breaks and all that, it, it, was, it was perfect. Jerry did it. He was great. Plus, Jerry had... Uh, the one thing that everybody else before hadn't had. Jerry had studio experience, professional studio experience with the Herndon Edwards Band. He knew how he knew what to do in a studio. He knew how to do it. He knew how to work with the engineer in setting up his instrument. He knew exactly how to take cues. He knew all of those things. And we had played those songs, uh, you know, using the keyboard as, as the rhythm section. We had played those songs for about a year and a half, and it had a chance to really work out the parts whether they be instrument parts or harmony parts. And so when we got in the studio, there we already knew exactly what we were going to do. It's just a matter of getting it right. And of course, Bob got it right. I mean, there's no doubt about it. He did a hell of a job recording us. The CD turned out great. Yeah, it did. We had a CD release party at the uh, Chick's Beach Cafe, one of our signature clubs that we had played for years. Thank you, Gene and Gloria. Yes. Um, and... Uh, everybody was there. I mean, the place was packed because by this time, we had a real following. I mean, I'm not saying we filled all the chairs with, you know, relatives and real close friends. These people were followers of the band and supported the band. And we sold a shitload of CDs that night. But we also did a live performance. Tom and Jerry had tuxes on, I remember. <laughs> And uh, I was I was just in an all black 
uh, I think it was, you know, just pants and a jacket. I don't remember. But anyway, we, we did a live performance that night. And the album really was a success. It took off really well here locally. Um, so we were thrilled. It was the second second CD after Songsmith. And so we were thrilled. And that was October the 13th, 1991 the CD release party was. And the way I remember that is my baby brother who, who used to be our drummer. It's his birthday. Well, how would you characterize your stage experience with Tom? I mean, it's hard to ask the wife, but I mean, if you can be unbiased at all, how would you characterize your own personal feelings about your experience with Tom as a, as a, as a partner in music? Um, I tried really hard to keep myself calm because I got a little nervous sometimes. And sometimes sound checks would go on for fucking ever. And, you know, test one, two, test one, two. I don't know how many times you can listen to that, but I guess a million if you're trying to get the sound right. And he always got the sound right. But I have to say, a lot of respect. Um, I dabbled. I mean, I drank. Um, not till I got, I was never drunk on stage. But I would always have a couple of drinks before we started because, like I said, I would get knots and I was nervous. I didn't, I did not have, and still don't have a lot of self confidence. And I think that's from my father criticizing and breaking me down all those years. Tom says I'll, I'll never lose it. I've tried really hard to be better at it, but um, I didn't have a lot of self confidence. Um. You know, uh, I knew I knew the material. I knew I knew the, the lyrics. Never forgot lyrics on stage, which a lot of people do, but I never did, thankfully. And um, just, he was the straight man. Tom never did drugs. Tom never drank. He did not drink, period. He was the one who took care of the band and the sound. And it was all about the music with him. There was no drama, no bullshit. And I knew from seeing the way he acted with the male musicians that, you know, I didn't expect to be treated any differently. And I wasn't. He didn't treat me any differently. Now, if I'd gotten hurt or something like that on stage, I'm sure he'd been on his knees right in front of me to try and help me. But as far as the music went, it was no nonsense, and it was just do your job, do your job, and song after song, I did it. And when I came home, we never talked about the gigs. We never argued about the gigs. We never argued about who each other was talking to or anything that happened on stage. Um, basically, uh, we stayed away from drugs. We put all of our money into new pieces of equipment for the band. Anything Tom wanted, uh, I handled the money, so I tried to make sure that he could have anything that he wanted. And that's that's what we did. That's how it went. I understand. Yeah. But he deserved all my respect. He really did. He worked hard. He was teaching. He was working two jobs. I was working for a law firm. He was working two jobs, and we were playing gigs on the weekends. So... That's hardcore, but then that's who he's been. As far as I yeah. know, that's who he's always been. Yes, he's a he's a he's a working dog. So, do you have any favorite moments? Favorite moments. One of my favorite moments was when we were recording the uh, Songsmith album, and right before it was time for me to go into the keyboard studio and record my tracks I slammed three of my left hand fingers in that door and I've never felt pain like that in my whole life and my three fingers were like bruised across the fingernails and I was just working them out and working them out and about 20 minutes later it was time for me to go in and Record And, of course, Tom knew that I'd smashed my hand in the door or my fingers in the door. And he knew. and But he was so cool 
in the studio. He never made you feel on edge. He never made you feel like time is money. Hurry up. Get it on there. Do your job. I mean, he was never like that. He was just like at a football game or something. You know, he was jovial. He was calming. He got you whatever you needed. He was just great in the studio. That's my Tommy. He was great. But anyway, got in there and... It was the first time that a piano had mimicked his exact finger picking. So he was finger picking um, the song, and I was um, uh, repeating it on a keyboard and did it in one shot. Came out first time, first take. Even with my bruised fingers, Alton, I did it. All alone in an empty room Praying winter doesn't come too soon Autumn breezes in a quarter moon Wish you had your arms around me Just tonight I'm for a lonely heart That has wandered way too far Feeling funny from the very start about the way I really feel, but babe of my life, when I see you tonight, I'd be happy if you'd be so kind. When I have you to hold, it's so hard to control the feelings running through my mind. I find myself wanting you, and everything will be alright. To stay until the morning light the light comes shining down around you I find myself wanting you And everything will be alright To stay until the morning light the light comes shining down around you Every lover has a secret side Every vision far and wide Hoping that you'll always stay in stride Every moment lasts forever Tell the maestro to it way down low Catch her glancing from the mistletoe Watch her nodding through a late night show Seems so near and yet so far Oh, babe of my life When I see you tonight I'd be happy if you'd be so kind When I have you to hold It's so hard to control The feelings running through my mind I find myself wanting you And everything will be alright to stay until the morning light Light comes shining down around you I find myself wanting you And everything will be alright To stay until the morning light Light comes shining down around you
You know, that's not the first time I've heard that. The first time I heard it was through Tom, and he is super proud of you for that. I think he's told that story a couple times. He didn't know that he told it the first time. I was super scared. I didn't want to disappoint him. Oh, my God. How stupid can you be? Nah, he, he tells that story. I remember the first time he told it, and it was just like, it was a lot of different types of pride, but that's his story for you. If he had to tell one story that he could tell the public, that's the one. Well, I got another one for him. Okay. And that was on his 39th birthday. And I was already 40 because I'm a year and four months older than he is. So I was already 40. But it was his 39th birthday, and we were playing a place called Smackwater Jacks. I know. And um, I had bought him. Well, first of all, he had been to Audio Light and Musical, ALM, which was the music store here. And he had seen a guitar that he really, really wanted. And, of course, any way I could, I would rearrange the money to try and make sure he got it. Well, it happened to be close to his birthday, but he'd been going in there for a couple months looking at this same guitar. So I called Audio Light and Donnie Satterwhite, our pedal steel player for so many songs. He was working there, and he's the guy who sold Tom the EPS that enabled us to do all the horns and stuff. Anyway, I called Donnie and I said, Donnie, tell me about this guitar. Do you know anything about it that Tom's looking at? And he goes, yeah, man. He goes, I know all about it. I said, well, tell me about it. He's going on to describe this guitar, told me it was a Stratocaster and that it was an electric guitar. And, you know, Tom just, it was, it was black, really pretty black and silver. I think anyway, so I said, well, Donnie, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to put that guitar in the back and hold it for me. And don't tell Tom. I said, when he comes in again, just tell him you're sorry that you sold it. So Donnie said, damn, Tanya, that's cruel. I said, I know, <laughs> but we're playing this weekend. He's going to have it in his arms before he knows it. So he said, all right, I'll do it. So I think that was like on a Tuesday and uh, Tom had to teach uh, both in Chesapeake and Wesleyan on that Thursday night. Right. So I went down and his birthday was Saturday, September 15th. So I went down on Thursday night and I paid for the guitar and I got the guitar and I put it in my, my trunk because at the time Tom had a, um, he had a, a a truck and you know with a cab on it and that's how we're all how all the the uh, equipment got from place to place so i didn't have to worry about him going in my trunk and it was coming on the weekend and we were playing friday night and then saturday night you know come to think of it i think his birthday was on friday i think it was a friday night because i was really excited and i knew that he wouldn't be going in my trunk but um he went in there on wednesday to see Donnie. And when he looked up on the wall, the guitar was gone. And he said, Donnie, where's the strat? And Donnie goes, Oh, Tom, I thought I'd have at least a while before I had to tell you, but I sold it yesterday. He goes, I just, I couldn't help it. The people wanted to buy it. And so I sold it. And so Tom was really depressed. I mean, he came home and I couldn't figure out what it was. I knew what it was, but <laughs> I couldn't. I really, at the beginning, it didn't dawn on me. And I said to him, I said, what's the matter, bud? Why are you so down? Did something happen at school? He's like, no, I went by A&M and Donnie sold the guitar. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, he sold it. And I said, well, we'll just have to find you another one. So nothing else was said. And of course, Tom, he just. He let it go. I'm sure it bothered him a little bit. But first break at Smackwater Jacks on Friday night, September the 15th. My mom was there. My little sister was there. Um, all our friends were there. Everybody knew it was his birthday. And Jerry's birthday was on September 9th. So we had a double birthday cake for Jerry and Tom. Kind of celebrated both their birthdays that night. And he was talking to everybody and thanking them all for coming and everything. And um, 
somebody said, Tanya's coming up to the stage. I think she has a gift for you. And so my somebody from the audience, well, I guess it was either Jerry or somebody, who they all knew, she has a gift for you. And so uh, they brought a chair up on stage and he sat down and I put the guitar case in his lap and he was looking at me like his mouth was like open, like, what is this? And when he opened it up, there was his strat. And he was so happy. So that's another one of my really fun memories of Tom. Wow. What a story. Yeah. And he's never told me that ever. Nope. He got his Stratocaster that night. Night he turned 39. 39 is a good year. Sure was. And then, of course, you know, all the different clubs. Yeah. I mean, we opened for a bunch of groups. Um, uh, we opened for uh, Poco. We opened for um, Firefall at the Boathouse in Norfolk, at you know, down where uh, Waterside is. Um, it was a big Boathouse back then and had all kinds of concerts and national acts in. We opened for those bands. Um, and then we did a big uh, charity event. And the big star was Clarence Clemens from the East Street Band and Bruce Springsteen. And so um, we were the only band. There were so many bands, local bands that played at this thing. But when the Tom Farley Cam Head Band got up there, Clarence Clemens wanted to play with us. So he was on stage with us with his saxophone. And I mean, we were doing like 69 Pimp Mobile, Jody Lee Carroll. We were doing all this stuff. And he was playing. That was a really, really fun gig. And I mean, we had my brother on drums. It was before they left the band. So, but it was, it was all for charity, but he's a really, he was a really, really nice man. I got pictures with his arm around me. (laughs) What a story. (laughs) Yeah. He was great. Very humble. Very nice man. That's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Time and life are undefeated. This is the wind down in my estimation. Tanya and Tom explain this transition from one life to another, a segue to the next chapter. Jerry had uh, actually had uh, some some issues that he had to deal with. He had to move to Florida. And so the band broke up, not because they really wanted to, but because Jerry had to leave. Uh, We had Dave Hamby sit in for a little while just to finish out our gig stuff, which I really appreciate that because he's a great talent, too. But uh, then we, you know, we just kind of backed off. That, about that, that was 1996. We had just moved into Thurgood. My parents uh, had, uh, my dad had a stroke. My mama had Alzheimer's coming on. And my husband bought me the house of my dreams. Well, yeah, that was, it was a nice place. Uh, the thing is, is that, you know, Tanya and I decided to take on the, to be the, the primary caregivers and, and looker after rubbers of, of my mother and father. And I was working for law firms for many, many years. And so I left the law firm that I was working for. And uh, she, she spent her, her days. Uh, I mean, I was working at uh, uh, Chesapeake uh, and at Virginia Wesleyan. But, uh, you know, she took care of them, made sure that all their meds and stuff like that visited them every day. Uh, you know, they were right around the corner in old donation uh, apartments. and Two minutes away, and I loved them so much. Well, they, uh, they also... Um, um, uh, because of that, you know, the music just kind of backed off, uh, which is fine because we wanted to dedicate that time and that energy uh, to them. Uh, I was able to take all the stuff that we had that we had done and actually start working on uh, working on new stuff, but didn't record anything until later on, until 2006. But at the end of the day, um, the next time that we performed uh, was, I mean, actually really performed was 20 years later. Uh, we had never, ever played uh, songs with a, a full-blown band. I mean, you know, with a drummer instead of a keyboard doing the thing, and a bass player instead of the keyboard doing stuff. And in 2006, we were married 30 years. Just don't forget that, okay? We'd been together 30 oh, yeah. years. This this particular concert, uh, which was the High Energy Acoustic Band concert, had eight people on stage. Um, and I, I've talked about this before, but uh, in terms of, of Tanya and I, Tanya had not performed live uh, on stage for 20 years. 
And basically, you know, she had maybe sat in with me when I was doing a solo on, on a song or two, but but nothing, you know, of any consequence in terms of an active uh, musical career. And now we've gone to 2017. Six, 16. 16. Okay. 2016. And this is a, you know, this band, uh, what consummate professionals, uh, many of them who had, had recorded in the studio with us before, like Donnie Satterwhite and, and Pete Schonard and Ken McNeil uh, uh, and Greg Weichel. Uh, these, uh, I mean, Joanna Benford and, and Richard had not recorded with us as yet. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, Richard had, he did uh, You Ain't Never. But uh, at, the, at the end of the day, well, Joanna did too, because she was, <laughs> both of them were on the calm before this, uh, the, the By the Fence and the Sun album. Duh. Uh, so I mean, so we were on stage, and that was a great, uh, a great mix of musicians. A, a one take, first take time for all those songs, and it was stellar. And when Tani came out and did her "Baby Can I Hold You" signature tune, oh, I mean, it was. I mean, you know, this is a woman who had not performed on stage a lick, not a single lick for twenty years, and came in and just kicked some serious ass on that song. I mean, everybody just loved it. I mean, I got the video, I got the audio. It's on. It, it's on an album. I mean, you know, it's there. To be honest, the the recorded version of that on "Calm Before the Storm" was mm-hmm. was was an excellent version that I did of that. Oh yeah. This is many many years later. My voice is a lot deeper now. I mean, I used to be able to sky out on the notes to Dalen Frogelberg above Vernon, and boy, he had some range and. But this was uh, this was the alto Tanya now, and that was a really good song. Because Tracy Chapman, you know, she doesn't sky out, but it was a good song. But yeah, it was scary in that I I, I hadn't sung in that many years. But also, um, it was a band that I really hadn't sung with. But I had my partner by my side. I had Tom, and he was my rhythm man in more ways than one. Uh, I just, I, and so, I don't know, I just went for it. And he, he continues to rave over it, although I don't see the magic in it. But thank you, Tom. I appreciate that, sweetie. Well, that you took the long way around the barn of being humble, I can tell you that much. But everybody who was there, the response went on that, everybody was there knew exactly what was going on. And they realized that they hadn't seen Tanya in 20 years. And many of the people in the audience were our fans and friends, uh, you know, for decades. And when they came out and saw us actually put that all together with those great musicians, um, it was a spe- very special evening, and it was a great performance by Tanya in all respects. Plus, it, it was the last chance that people actually had to, uh, to hear us both sing together. Uh, we have a really distinct-sounding vocal harmony blend together. It's, it's lower range. It's not high like a lot of people go for and so a lot of our harmonies really kind of concentrate on the, the alto tenor aspects of things to begin with. And then we'd have like somebody like Cam or Jerry or Vernon would take a, take a high part or whatever, or Tanya and Vernon would swap off on the high parts. But at the end of the day... And Michael Monahan. Oh, oh phew, God, yeah, Michael. Michael could sky out. You no know, shit, Michael was great to sing with. We had great harmony with him. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, you know, that was a, a great moment. It was, a, I guess you could say, that was the last time that either one of us had performed live. And uh, uh, doing our material. And uh, if, if it was a swan song, it was a hell of a swan song. Because at the end of the day, I, you know, I captured it. I got a, a live album out of it. And the players who are, were on that album with us are just some of the best in the area. We were really blessed to and have we all got a t-shirt. <laughs> we all got a t-shirt. Yeah, we got the t-shirt. That's for sure. So uh, it, 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 was a, it was a great moment for us. Well, Tanya, I really appreciate this. But before we let you go, I got one more one more question for you. Okay. So your life with Tom, after everything that you've been through with him, everything that you were going through to get to him, to this point in your life, what is your take on him? What, what would you say? This is in a few sentences. What would you say? Well, number one that I'm a very lucky woman. Number two, that I love him more today than I did yesterday. Every day, he amazes me. Um, I'll be 71 on May the 10th. And I have never had a day in my life 
that I did not feel honored and loved and treasured by that man. And I'm sorry that I'm getting tearful, but it's a love story that not many people will ever know. It's a love story. The path taken that not people will ever hear, but I know it. And that's all that matters is that I know it. And whoever you share it with will know it. Um, I've had a great life, a very blessed life with a beautiful man. And that's really all I can say. We never had children, but I think sometimes that it's a blessing because we just gave our lives to each other. Her love, what she says to him says it all. And it doesn't get any better or any more raw than this. We're right now in 2021 and we've been through a horrible pandemic. Um, uh, I have health issues, and so it was very, very important that, you know, I protect myself. I've now had both my shots. But through it all, oh, Tom has been right by my side, and the love has just grown every day between us. Um, I don't think that there's ever a time that I can really truly be without him. His face is always right in front of mine. I love him very much. And he deserves my love because he's been a wonderful husband, partner, um, lover, uh, work buddy, everything. And so I want to thank him for introducing me to music um, and for allowing me to be on that stage. And I want to thank him for believing in me all these years and being my partner in crime and... Um, the last thing I'd like to say is, as far as I'm concerned, every song he's ever written is a masterpiece. But the true masterpiece, because of things in my family, of I've lost a nephew to drugs, has been his song, Free Me. Um, the song is beautiful. The song is right on tune with what a mother goes through with a child that is addicted. The song has hope. It's got love. It's got sadness. It's got everything in it. And it's just a beautiful song. So for those of you out there who have never dialed up Tom or Farley ser Music Services or Tom Farley's music, do yourselves a favor and type in Tom Farley Free Me on YouTube and sit back and listen. It's the most beautiful song, I think, that I've ever heard. I might be a little biased, but it's beautiful. And as far as ending, that was the last thing that I recorded with him, I think, on on uh, on tape as my background vocals. And one of the background vocalists is Joanne King, and she's my sister and my baby sister and the mother of my nephew, who we lost to drugs, and she is on there for background vocals. The song means a lot to me, but I think it would mean a lot to everybody else and faced with the terrible thing of drugs that we're faced with these days. Um, and that's pretty much all I want to say.
give my love to my husband again and um, thank him and love and good luck to all of you out there. I hope everybody stays safe and healthy and that we come back to a normal, happy life. I thank love you, Tony. I love you. He's just, he's if what you see with Tom is what you get, honestly. And you know that, Alton. I do. I do. Absolutely. He's, I'm just very blessed. That's all. Well, Tanya, thank you. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate you. I was excited to get this one done in the can. Uh, you were everything I thought you'd be. I love you and thank you. I thank you, Alton. Um, I hope I didn't get too breezy about things, but um, I love you too. You're my husband's partner, your family, and I, I love you and I love Lauren. Please give her my love and uh Thanks. Thanks for taking the time. Not a problem. It's my pleasure. Mine too, baby. This episode was produced by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick, edited and mixed by Alton Riddick for Edit Your Truth. And a big thank you to Silent Voices International Radio for having us. On behalf of Tom, this is Alton signing off until we meet again on The Path Taken.